So uh, thank you very much. I, um, one of the interesting elements, uh, if you have been in this industry for quite some time, is to, to realize uh, that there are major trends, you know, that happens about 20, 25 years. So I took it from the beginning of the integrated circuit. And then, uh, you know, eventually the MOS uh, was able to stabilize itself around 1974, 75. And uh, for the next 25 years, it uh, was very easy to uh, essentially do more of the scaling. It was very, you know, very easy to do this. We had a crisis around 2002, 2003, and we had the next phase. And now we are quickly approaching the fourth phase. And so that's what I want to discuss about the transition. Now, uh, if you look at the, the situation, uh, most people like to look at trends in the sense, oh, this has been going on for 10 years, so it's easy, I can extrapolate for the next 10 years. And that's you know, the recipe for disaster, because normally, if, if something has been going on for 10 years, most likely it's going to fail in the next 10 years. But people like to delay doing something about it, and so there are penalties. Uh, penalties if you delay and you neglect to, to plan ahead, it will be more expensive, and performance will go down. Now, this is very theoretical. Let me show you a very specific example. So typically, the cost from one generation of technology to the next was between 5 and 10%. But two things have not occurred. First of all, EUV has not gone into manufacturing yet. And people say, oh, it's okay, I can use two, three, four exposure for a single layer. That means you multiply your cost by 4x. So at this point, uh, we are, you can see, in the last three generations, the cost doubled. This is not compounded, it's per generation, okay? So you can see, at this point, we should be doing 450, nobody's talking about it. So they'll pay the price later on. And in performance, uh, 1989, we published that by 2001, we are going to run into a major crisis because all you have to do is multiply the number of transistors by frequency. They were doubling every generation. You were bound to run a wall around this time frame. So everybody said, oh, transistors don't work any longer. They cannot give us what they used to give us. So these two elements, you know, they are two very different. Uh, people always mix them up. One is uh, Moore's law. And the other one was the NARD said, and the goal was completely different. In one case was make as many transistors per die as you can. The other one, how to optimize the transistor. But somehow people built this hybrid and they forgot that these two things are not the same thing. So for the last 10 years, Moore's law has come to an end. Okay, if you look at the data, it doesn't seem like. They say, oh, it's not Moore's law. It's the transistor are not good any longer. So if you go in telecom, where people can use 10 million transistors instead of a billion transistor, you can see that these are 90, 65, 45, this is 200 gigahertz. It means you are switching about five picoseconds. Oh, but this is different from what the people do in, uh, in, the, in the industry. Well, so all you have to do is to, everybody has become clever. They don't calibrate the graph anymore, but uh, I had 30 years of experience doing reverse engineering. So they made the mistake of putting seven and five picoseconds. Then this is normalized to 65. Here it is. This is normalized to 45. And so all you have to do, oops, sorry. You have to measure this and you can see the number. Essentially, we are now at about two picoseconds. It means doing 500 gigahertz is no problem. So there's got to be a problem somewhere because the more slow is working. Transistor can switch at 500 gigahertz and we can only operate at 5 gigahertz. So let's see what we did. We enjoy scaling. And this is it's not the same photograph magnified three times. Okay, These are different. And you can see it was the famous no brain scaling. Okay, You just go to the next step. And everybody made a lot of money. Many companies came up, but it was very simple. So uh, the, the NTRS started around 1992. I joined at the end of 94, but I had a very specific reason to join that I explained in 1997. That was about 20 years after you know, the stabilization of the integrated circuit in MOS. And so I presented this simple graph, very elementary, you know, high school level. It simply said the thickness uh, of the oxide is about four nanometer. 
and you shave a couple of layers every time, by 2005, there won't be any layers. And uh, I look at, you know, I presented this to a field of, of uh, experts. I want to show you the reaction. They see this, all of a sudden, it's a disaster. The industry is coming to an end. And I'm surprised that these people that were very knowledgeable acted as if they didn't have the foggiest idea of what I was talking about. So what I did, I managed in a very short time to put together the international effort because it was obvious that this was exceeding the capability of any single company. And so in July 1998, we began what I call the equivalent scaling. Essentially, we're still gonna get performance, but to scale in a different way. And so I presented this plan, and I said, by 2020, we're supposed to do this kind of transistor. Again, the audience was enthusiastic, but I was building an immunity by now. I knew what to expect from the audience, so I'm counting on you, okay? So please don't disappoint me, okay? So if you look at what happened by 2011, well, this when the industry really started putting money into this. That was the intermediate point. Essentially, all this uh, had come into reality. So by a concentrated effort, by planning for something 10 to 15 years ahead, you can defeat almost any roadblock. So in 2011, we were at this point. So I was done, 2012, I left Intel because this was done, this was too slow, I needed to do something a little faster now. So if you look at uh, what I, in 2013, I was invited uh, at uh, 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 Semi-Japan, and I said, okay, we have another challenge. Uh, if you look at the name of the nodes, by 2021, we will be doing three nanometer. By 2024, one nanometer, that's the end. And uh, so we are again in this situation. And once again, the crowd didn't disappoint me. Again, it seemed like I never heard about it, okay, that this was going to come to an end. So I said, what we need to do is a Manhattan process. So I talked about this in Washington, and there were a lot of people from the military, they all froze. I said, no, 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 what I mean is uh, Manhattan used up all day to this space, and so they build skyscrapers, okay? So it's very simple to understand what you're supposed to do. And so my buddy, Keenan Kim from UCLA, you guys train him well. And so he came out and said, yes, we're gonna do more than 100 layers. So immediately say, okay, this is ratified. And you can see that immediately you have a benefit that the number of masks get immediately drops to three generations before. This was one of the reasons why it's created all this uh, cost in, in the very beginning. So then we, we ne needed to restructure the ITRS that I call ITRS uh, 2.0. And uh, so immediately we took uh, notice of this and we say, okay, one terabit by 2022, the 100 layers that Kinan Kim said, but this is not the end. We can imagine that we can build 300 layers. So memory guys are poor, so they have to do what they have to do just to survive. How long is it gonna take to convince the noble guy, the rich guy that make logic that this is the right way of doing it? So, I moved the, the ITRS into IEEE because uh, at this point it was more congenial to discussion about devices and system because now the industry was driven by, device, by, by systems and we couldn't drive it any longer bottom up. I needed to drive it top down. So uh, Subashis is going to talk about this and this is one of the elements that can really alleviate the problem. So it's going to talk to everything from the silicon app, I'm gonna talk what needs to be done here that nobody wants to really talk about. So uh, I was invited uh, at, uh, uh, um, again, a Semicon Japan in 2013, after a year I had left, and they, say, they asked me from Intel, they say, what is gonna be the next technology? I say, okay, let me show you what the next technology is gonna be. At this point, you had this, and all you have to, you can eliminate one of the fins as long as you make it a little taller, and then the next time, you can make even fewer fins. You make it a little taller and a little taller. Now, I was really going on the limb on this, so I held my breath for six months. But then I could breathe again because Mark Bohr came out and said, is this what we 
doing, and that's what we're going to do. So you can see that the fin went from 34 to 42, but it could eliminate one of the fins. And this is the real thing. And so, you know, my, my point is, uh, give me a data point, I'll have a range. Give me two points, I'll have a trend. Give me the third point, this is a fundamental law of physics. <laughs> and so, Mark uh, came out in March, and you can see you have uh, 34, 42, 53, basic math, 25%, I know the universe, okay? So, I say, okay, let's analyze uh, how long is it going to take him to demonstrate that 2D coming to an end. Now, you can see that the advent of FinFET uh, improved the compaction precisely by playing with the fins and all these other elements. And so, this was a very uh, positive element. So of course, I got all the numbers. I put all these lines and I can tell you all the details. And so this, uh, remember this number, 0.37. This is a very good number. Essentially, the next uh, device is about 30% of the previous one. But then, this one is uh, the static RAM. You do the same thing, and you have 0.59. So you understand that you have a problem, and it's in the basic static RAM cell. So maybe if I attack the static RAM cell, I can convince people that there is a problem. So, if you look at the layout, so you can see that in the logic layout, uh, this is extremely regular. But if you look in the cell, there is a gap here, a gap here, a gap here. You know that something is going on. You're trying to make do, but there is something basically wrong. Now, all the numbers to the left are all officially published by, pay, by company. So, there are no my numbers. So you can see first, uh, you can translate these funky names in what the real half pitch. So if you want to use metal, it's a 2x, uh, this is one and a half. And then they will merge eventually to 3x, so what people are talking. It's like somebody's called Robert, but you call them Bob, you know, Richard, Dick. So this is Bob, Richard, you know, and these are the real name for extended, okay? And, but you can see something that sticks out. And you can start to see there is something that really doesn't want to scale down. You know, essentially the fin doesn't want to scale down. So you ask yourself, why is that the case? So, you know, remember these three numbers? I had another 25%, and I know that by three nanometer, you have 100, 110 nanometer fin height. But why is this important? Because how are you going to get your current through? So the only way you can get more current through a fin fat, you have to make it, the cross-section has to increase. So at this point, I'm ready to attack the static RAM cell, and you know the number, 0.59, as opposed to 0.37. So why is this 0.2 more? So you know the basic uh, cell. You guys are all experts in this. So this uh, cell, I took it from IEDM, uh, 2016 from a leading company in foundry that lives in Taiwan. They had a photograph that made the mistake, so I have all the numbers, okay, the, the seven nanometer first generation. And you can see where the disaster is. So you look at this number, you say, you know, the fin pitch should be 27. Well, Let's see what you have. Remember, you took the two transistor and you put the P well, you know, you want the P well together. Okay, so I measure very carefully this number, the distance between this and the edge of the, of the end well, 25 nanometer. This 25 nanometer. So 27 has become 50, and here has become 50. So I already lost 50 nanometer right there. And then you can see this monster contact here in the middle that is using up a lot of space. So these are the things that they want to eliminate, okay? So you know precisely all the dimensions. You know the height, uh, the width. So flip it on the side, and now you have all the numbers that you need. First of all, you see that the end well has disappeared. That was 50 nanometer right there, okay? So this has disappeared. Second problem, since we're trying to do the gate, you know, with quadruple exposure, if you try to do a 10 nanometer gate, the li line edge roughness is about 4 to 5 nanometer. Means you have a gate that can be 10 nanometer or 15 nanometer. Take your pick. But if you do it in this way that is deposited, is it a 10 nanometer or 10.5 nanometer? 
Now, my question is, which gate would you rather have? Okay? Now, look at this. You know, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 60 nanometer. Remember, they were supposed to do 100. This is a cost reduction. Okay? So, how would you lay it out this uh, part? Okay? So, you have the two inverters. Then you have transistor. You have an extra transistor. You'll find something to do with this. And then contact to the gate, to the diffusion, and to the output transistors. And now you put the numbers, since we have all the numbers, and this comes out 110 by 108. So call it 110 by 110. Now I remind you that this was 250 by 100. So you throw in away 150 nanometer of real estate. You could put two and a half cells in what you're doing here. <coughs> so, but if you do one thing, one will do two things. After all, 60 plus 60 is 120. You are supposed to do 110 just to make one thin transistor. Why don't you make four of them with an extra 10 nanometers? So, at this point, uh, this, uh, I have the laws of the universe. I have everything I ever wanted. So, these are the real size. These are real size published by companies. I apply this 59, these are the projected number. So in four generations, a 12% compounded redu reduction rate. Then I do the layout, I know the thin pitch, the height, I know everything. And I get a 4% reduction, you know, compounded rate if you do two transistors. And if you put four, you get 0.28 compounded rate. So these are the numbers that you have to keep in mind. And now let's do a test. So are we going to have a disaster or are we going to have something good? So now I'm going to do a test. If I've done my calculation right, apply 0.59. This one is for the 2D transistor. I should expect which number? One, two, three, four. How many generations? The audience is not paying attention. Four generations, OK? Now, if I do instead two transistors, I get six generations with the same amount of real estate, the same amount of technologies, not new technology. And I can have 11 generations if I do this. But now I'm going to be generous. Why don't I even make, meet uh, the rules of Moore's law? Why don't I change this to 0.5? So now I get a, a cell that finally scales down 50% per generation. What would I get with this? Well, this would fail. We knew it takes four generations to get it done at 0.59. So this out. This one is a five in a little gain. But this other one, nine generation. So two times nine is 18. Three times nine, 27. You got 27 years, 25 years, if you follow this approach. So. If you look at what this uh, was, you can see this was messy. Well, if you look at this, they look almost the same. And now behold, <laughs> let me show you the future. This is called universal logic layout. Whether this is uh, two or four transistor and they're going to make a static RAM cell, or you're going to make a logic uh, NAND, or you do this once and you're done. So, I gave this at the UV symposium, and they were discussing about the next uh, NA, you know, that's going to cost, uh, you know, each tool 200 million. I said, but you said you can do about 10 nanometer now. It's not what we need. We need people to work on this structure because you can do it now. And you can do it once for all, and this is becomes almost like an ASIC. The only thing you have to decide how you're going to connect all these different elements. So. Let me show you what happens you know, in the next uh, group, because I want to make sure when I come back in 2040, you don't tell me you hadn't told us. So I want to be straight with you. Okay? I'll tell you what really happens. So what we've done with the roadmap, we blanked out you know, at 2024 everything of 2D. So people go on the roadmap that will be published in the next couple of months, and there is nothing for 2D. No, I'm trying to really send the message but there is all this part, uh, you know, it is just a draft, you know, we'll fix it in the next couple of months. There is going to be 3D. The, you know, you, you pay me now, you pay me later 10x. So, in summary, you know, we 
save the situation, was very well uh, done, you know, with geometrical scaling. We took advantage of all the knowledge that existed. And we were able, just in time, to insert uh, this equivalent scaling uh, with the 2003-2024. Uh, we inserted high-K, metal gate, fin fat, all these elements that are still good, you know, until the middle of the next decade. And now we are, you know, we need to plan now for the next generation that I just demonstrated can give you nine generations of technology, okay? So I, this division, remember what I did in 1998, now is the vision for the next 25 years. And uh, that's what it is, okay? So just turn the transistor up, but if I did in 1998, they would have kicked me out, but now hopefully you're not gonna do the same. And so the point is, uh, my question is, how long will the industry delay the conversion to 3D monolithic integration, trying to do quintuple mask exposure, inserting UV on one layer, asking for a high NA, and uh, claiming that the transistor cannot do 100 gigahertz. So fortunately, Eli said, why don't we invite some of the architect to explain why they cannot use 5 billion transistor going at 100 gigahertz, because we can. Thank you, that's all for now. Okay. So, Paolo, uh, as, as you started your talk, I thought, okay, uh, uh, Gargini, he's declaring Gargini's law, the Finns get 30% higher with each generation. But it seems, uh, as, as uh, you concluded your talk, it's not going to be taller Finns, it's uh, going to be uh, 3D stacking, uh, in effect, putting the Finns uh, sideways. Yes. and uh, uh, getting a, a lot more uh, surface area that way. Uh, is, is that sort of a representation of how you see the future? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the more we delay, the more money we waste. It's really is the direct, uh, but you know, at the conference at the UV next, last month, everybody was saying, we need high NA, we need to do five nanometer. I say, you know, how about? Yeah, just to translate, NA is numerical aperture. Numerical aperture, of okay. The, uh, uh, Only the, uh, the applied material and LRC guy applauded me. You know, yeah. there were a few of them, but they okay. were very happy. Okay, let's have some more questions uh, out there. If you don't ask question, means you agree, so thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. You kind of just brushed over it very uh, briefly. How are you going to contact all those stacked gates in that very tight pitch that you showed in that universal logic? That's layout? why I relax. If you saw, I put, you know, first of all, the number should have been nine nanometer. If what, that's what at present people are planning for the 2D. So I relax it to 10 nanometer and relax the contact to 10 to 15 nanometer. Okay, so I gave him an extra 50%. No, no, but you got four gates to contact in that little space. Yeah, yeah. So you got to have a contact, you might, or can you do the layout where you don't have to contact every one of those gates? I don't, th I don't think so. Yeah. So you have to fit four contacts in that one 15 nanometer gap. They have 14 layers of metal in which they are planning. <laughs> right now, I can't, if you count uh, uh, even the... The, the present cell has like 10 contacts, you know, so you will have to work it and out. You won't have to contact the source drains in the inside transistors. The, cir the circuits are all going to use those for NANDs. Yeah, or something. essentially, you have to contact, you know, the gates, and then a lot of the contacts are on the top. So there are, you know, there, yeah. there's some challenge. I'm not yeah. saying that it's done, but what I'm saying, the payback is humongous, okay? Can you tell us how you're going to uh, uh, synthesize the uh, layers? Because we usually think of epi, but you must have some uh, better idea in mind. No, I, I talked to the applied material guys. Essentially, you know, wh when I used to do with TJ Rogers at Stanford, we blew yeah. up the epi reactor because we were doing pins in this way. Yeah. And now you can, you know, right now they're doing uh, hundreds of nanometer for the flash guy. But they have to do it so fast that it's polycrystalline. But if you only have to do a hundred nanometer, then you can do it slowly, and then you introduce a little dopant, and then you take. Yesterday, one but of your. But how do you isolate the layers then? Hmm? If you okay, I, I can understand you can you can uh, uh, grow epi that way, but uh, d don't you have to isolate the layers, or are you growing directly on oxide? How are you going to make those layers? 
right now already doping, the, you know, one of the challenges has, has been solved. Even in the fin fat, you have to dope sorts and drain. Yeah. Okay, so that was a challenge and people had to understand how to give. So I, I think there are challenges, but it's perfectly doable. Okay, and if, if you actually do it with epi, it's much easier because you introduce the dopant and now it's highly precision. You know, do 10, 20 nanometer, then you stop the dopant, and then the next one is the intrinsic. Oh, I see. Okay. You use doping to isolate Sequential. the layers. Yeah. Okay, it, very it's, interesting. It's, it, I talked to the applied guys, yeah. it's not impossible. Okay. okay. Can you make a comment about uh, power dissipation, heat removal, thermal oh, fats? Uh, is it going to be as challenging as 2D technologies? More challenging, less challenging? So, so you know, we don't want to get rid of all the engineers because you guys study for 10 years, right? And then we say, sorry, you don't have a job, okay? You just push a button, okay? So if you take Subashish, you know, it has a big problem, but I just did the transistor and Subashish is gonna tell you how it's gonna take the heat out of all the different layers, okay? But I'll give you some example, okay? Uh, there are many techniques that have been developed through the years, but they were never used because they were too expensive. But one of the guys in my group developed several patents with the microchannels, and so introducing uh, you know, microchannels that have refrigeration and so forth. Of course, if you wanna go into you know, something that is not mobile, then to have three or 400 watts, you have refrigeration, that is, you know, you can do it. So for the data center, is no problem. The only problem is in the mobile, you have to be more careful, but probably you don't need uh, so much power in the, in the mobile. And typically a phone consumes four to five watts. So you still have uh, this number to deal with, and you have to have probably microchannels or other element to decrease the heat, but, you don't need top performance. You're waiting for 100 milliseconds uh, for the signal to come back from the data center, so you can wait uh, for some time. So you can run the phones, uh, like now, two gigahertz uh, for the 5G. They're already saying, oh, maybe we do three gigahertz, but the 28 gigahertz is not gonna be on your phone, most likely, I'm not, it's not generated by your phone. So there are a lot of problems, but we wanna keep people employed, okay? <laughs> Okay, uh, so I suggest uh, we uh, corner Paolo for more questions uh, during the uh, coffee breaks. Uh, let's thank him again.